Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Anvesha Pandey, Deputy Director at Natal, and I am so excited to welcome you all to the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission Series, which intends to serve as a myth buster for India's digital health futuristic vision. And it also opened doors for multiple stakeholders. We have been running this series jointly with National Health Authority. The series targets to bring together all stakeholders, public and private, on one platform to discuss widespread adoption and implementation of the ABDM. Every week, we have an eminent speaker come on this platform and share their insights on one aspect of ABDM. Various aspects of ABDM implementation, like design, challenges, infrastructure needs, role of startups, data security, UHI, and others have been covered through string of webinars. Today we, will be um, today, we will be discussing how can integrators leverage ABDM and participate. And to discuss this topic, we have a very eminent our, and our much awaited speaker, Mr. Kiran Anandam Pele, with us today. A very warm welcome to you, sir. I'll just read out your short profile. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Kiran, Dr. Kiran is currently the advisor technology at the National Health Authority. He supports NHA to create digital public goods under India's two large digi digital health initiatives, the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission and Ayushman Bharat, the PMJ. He is telecom engineer by training and was a founding member of On Mobile. He was a volunteer with UIDAI for the Adha program and is currently a volunteer with the iSpirit Foundation where he works on the health staff. He's the founder and CEO of iDrishti, which delivers high quality eye care from a district hospital to the village level. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And to facilitate today's discussion, we have uh, Mr. Hardik Bedia with us today. He's the co-founder of PharmEasy. He was with Ascent Health and Wellness Solutions Private Limited, which got merged into PharmEasy. Hardik holds a bachelor's degree in electronics and telecommunication engineering and a master's in electrical and computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon University, Pennsylvania. Um, now I'll um, request Thank Hardik you, you and Dr. Kiran to please take these discussions forward. Sure. Thanks so much. Thank you. Glad to be here. So Hardik, you want to get started? Uh, maybe, uh, if you don't mind, Anvesha, so as we decided, I'll start Hardik yeah. with maybe a short presentation. Yeah. So that for our audience, uh, we can set some background on what does it mean to integrate with uh, the Ayushman Bharat uh, digital mission. And then sure. I understand that there have been a whole uh, set of questions that have kind of been shared in advance. And maybe then we can take up those yeah. queries for the audience. Sure. Yeah, great. So uh, this is not going to take more than 15, maybe 20 minutes at best. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get it. I'm not going to spend too much time. This is a series that's specific about the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission, as most of you might know. The key idea of the mission is to create something we call as digital building blocks for healthcare. So in this presentation, I'll try to explain to you what is this concept of digital building blocks and what is it that any entity who wants to kind of integrate with these digital building blocks kind of have to do. Now, before we do that, I think it's important to understand why uh, some of the design principles and approaches that the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission has adopted how it aligns with certain laws that are actually coming. So what is driving some of the thinking about health data and how exactly we should India go in health data? So many of you might know that the data protection bill, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, was recently tabled again in parliament and the pro bill, the draft bill that you see essentially talks about a construct called a data principle and a data fiduciary. And it very much applies to healthcare. So in the context of healthcare, every health hospital which is holding any health record will become a data fiduciary under the act and a patient will become a data principal. And now the bill doesn't really talk about ownership of data, but it instead talks about what rights do you, Mr. Hospital or Mr. Lab provider have to offer to a patient if you are holding the health records and all of us in healthcare hold health records. So it's going to be very important for us to be compliant to the law. The intent is if you're using a software that is ABDM compliant, we will make sure that you're also compliant to the law. And that's at a very high level principle, the idea that we're working on. And essentially what rights and how do you offer these rights? You offer these rights to the patients 
through a concept that is called as consents. And these consents need to be recorded. The fact that the patient has allowed for something need to be recorded with something called a consent manager. So in our ABDM architecture, I'll talk to you about how we have something called a health information exchange and consent manager that essentially enables the collection and management of these consents. And of course, all of this is supposed to be overseen by a certain authority that's called a data protection authority and that will all evolve as it comes. So of course, we, I think it will probably take about a year and a half to two uh, before this comes into place, but many of the technology principles are being put in now, place now by ABDM. Now, what exactly is ABDM trying to solve for? And the, there are many areas in ABDM, but I'll pick on the most relevant and the simplest area to start now. See, all of us who are in healthcare, we know that much of healthcare is already going digital. You know, it's very rare for some of you to have seen, a, say, a lab report, which is not a printed report, which means it was generated on the computer. It's also becoming very common for healthcare providers to share these reports, not just as a printout, but to also share it digitally. I mean, we all got a COVID test. We all probably got just an SMS. We went to some site, saw a PDF of a report from the patient or the lab's website. Now, this is great. The fact that a digital report is being shared with the patient, but to us, the issue is this report did not become part of your long-term history. It did not get added to the longitudinal record. So if you were to now try to find that COVID report for your COVID test, you may or may not be able to find it. And second, every institution is issuing a different format. So this is great, okay, for a human to read, a doctor to read, but it's not good for machines to read. So a history cannot be then used for, say, clinical analysis or a better representation and making it machine readable. And this is the problem that Ayushman Bharat Mission is one of the problems that the Ayushman Bharat Mission tries to solve. And what it says is that, Mr. Healthcare Provider, if you are sharing a report digitally, physically today, and it is already being generated on the computer, start by sharing it digitally using a national standard. And that national standard is linking the fact that you have a health report with something called a PHR address. And that's the first step that you have to do. And the second thing is when you get a request for sharing of that report, you share it, that report in a standardized format. And we use a standard called FHIR for that standard sharing of the report. So these are the two key things as a change that is expected from the healthcare provider. Now, what kind of reports can be shared? Pretty much anything. But one of the things that we learned by looking at the West is sometimes there is too much data in health records in the West. And so we have started with what we call as a more minimal data set in India. And we have chosen six types of reports that are very commonly shared with patients. And those are diagnostic reports, discharge summaries, OP consultation notes, prescriptions and immunization records. And for each of these various type of reports, there is a standardized format that has been published by ABDM and actually NRCES. NRCES is the National Resource Center for eHealth Standards. And they are the ones who have said, if you're publishing a diagnostic report in India in an FHIR format, here is what the Indian version of it looks like. And it's extended from the FHIR standards. And you can find that on the site and I'll share some of the links maybe later, but it's on nrces.in slash NDHM. And you can find those links. You'll also see them in the documentation on the ABDM sandbox as we go along. Now, in reality, what we expect to happen is that, that things that are already digital will start getting shared first on the network. So, for example, diagnostic reports and discharge summaries are likely to be shared first, whereas things like prescriptions and OP consultation notes are likely to take a bit longer because it requires a change in behavior. Your doctors need to create an e-prescription. Now they're more used to scribbling it out on a pad and tearing it off and giving it to you, and that is going to change time. So, ABDM is built to handle all of this, but there will also be a change that is expected on the health ecosystem. Now, we said you need to link your health record with an ABHA address. We used to call this formerly a health ID. So it's quite simple to create one while you're on the call. You can actually try it while we're here on the call. You can go and try to get your own ABHA address. It's now also issued by the Aragya Setu app. So if all of you have an Aragya Setu app, you can just launch your app and you'll see a little link there saying create your ABHA address. You can do it. You can also do it without your Aadhaar by just using the name, age, gender, and a mobile. And that's the idea. So think of it like an email ID 
that you create and it looks something like Kiran M8, NDHM or EBDM that you have on which you can collect all of your health records. Now, uh, of course, the whole system is designed to be voluntary. That means you create an ABHA address only if you intend to get your health records digitally. So you don't want your health records digitally for whatever your reasons, you don't have to get an ABHA address. And even, even after you've got it, you decide, hey, this is not what I want. You can actually opt out of it. And that's the idea of an ABHA to make it completely user control. So while we are on this, if any of you are interested, you can go to healthid.abdm.gov.in or even actually abha.abdm.gov.in and you can try creating it. Like I said, ROGC2 helps create it, Paytm helps create it, Doc Prime, Eka, several others actually are now helping create your ABHA address. And as you learn more, you will see that there will be a class of mobile applications that we call as PHR or personal health record applications that will help you create your ABHA and help you collect your health records from a variety of health facilities. There's also this construct of an assisted registration. So health facilities also can create it, especially for the elderly in their hospitals when people coming in. Now, how are we actually looking to get India started on this construct of personal health records? And the whole idea is quite simple. You have many health facilities which are creating health records all of these are typically done using a software. This is software is usually called an EMR system, uh, LMIS system, if it's a lab management kind of a system. What we want is that there is almost no change that is required at the hospital level too much in terms of change management, but there is a significant, not significant, but there is a change that's required in the software to make the software talk to ABDM. And one of the things that the software does is whenever there is a new health record created. So after a software has become ABDM compliant, let's say there's a new health record created in that software, that software either will notify ABDM that there's a new record or it will automatically link that record to a PHR address so that it becomes part of the system. And the consumers will have a whole choice of apps. So you can then say, okay, now that my records are linked to my ABA address, I'm going to use uh, Arugya Setu app or a Paytm app or a Eka Care app or any other PHR address app to view those records and not just view, you will now get the option to say, I can share this with my next doctor that I go to with my consent. And that's really how we are getting it to going. I'm happy to share with you that a lot of players have already started, in fact, finished their integration. So you have the Coven, you have all the hospitals, public hospital software players like eHospital and eShushrut. You have private labs like SRL Diagnostics, Krelio Health, and so on, who have already finished their integration and are starting to share records on the standard format. And you have a whole bunch of others from Apollo, Medanta, Narayana, Dr. Lal, and so on, almost 600 different integrators who are also working to actually make their software ABDM compliant. So we expect that in the March, April timeframe, that a lot of organizations which are creating health records digitally are going to be able to start sharing on the ABDM network in the linking it with PHR addresses and sharing their health records on the ABDM network in the next couple of months. Very similarly, there are several choice coming for consumers. We are seeing a lot of players actually build PHR apps. And just like in UPI, today you don't think about which app you use to pay which merchant. In the future, you will be able to choose any consumer app that you want, and you will be able to actually collect and your health records from any health facility that's participating in ABDM. And that's the vision. And I think you will all start seeing this touch our lives in the next few months as we kind of go forward. Now that we have understood the concept, let's get a little more into the tech to understand how does it actually work under the hood. So, where are these records, who's holding them, and what are these building blocks? Now, if you actually look at any hospital and software, we said that there is a software there that we called as a HMIS or LMIS system. In the ABDM architecture, the record is either held at that facility or it is held by the user in their PHR app. There is no other place where it is held. So there is no copy with the government. There is no data flow that goes through any of the ABDM building blocks. The links themselves, the PHR address and the links to where the records are is held by a building block that we call as a health information exchange and consent manager. So typically when you use a PHR app, 
to create a phr address you are actually creating an account on the health information exchange and consent manager and then when you say i am willing to share these records with somebody you are actually leaving a information behind at the hicm that you are making this change and you are also have the ability now to say hey i have changed my mind i want to revoke it so you can actually take back your consent and so on so a whole bunch of capabilities is enabled so if you go look at a phr address all you see is a bunch of links there is almost no information on what is the health data so we call the health information exchange and consent manager as data blind that is it doesn't know what is the health data and that is by design so wanted to reiterate and this is very important there is no central repository where all your health data is going for us to create this phr this is called a federated architecture your phr address is only holding links to the health data and then each health record is continuing to be held by the health facility that you decided to visit and it will share it and give you a copy only with consent and that's the crux of the abdm architecture in terms of how it works now we have certain terminologies that we use but any hospital that's willing to kind of share a health record we call as a health information provider and typically the software that's abdm compliant that actually enables this hospital or clinic uh to do it is called a health repository provider since it holds those health records now it's important to note that players like for example there is a company that i showed you called crilio health they have a hosted software in the cloud and they have almost 1200 plus labs that actually use the hosted software so from abdm perspective we expect only crilio health to do the integration and the best analogy for this is i would say uh to look at what uh, i learned from somebody else is to say look at bs3 as a standard we want you as consumers or as hospitals and as um clinicians or doctors to buy abdm compliant software to know about abdm and the benefits it does but not really have to get into the details you know we don't want you to know what does it take to build a bs3 car compliant car or a bs4 compliant car and that is really to be left to the vendors who make the software that actually you are buying and that's really the idea so abdm is really about trying to get anybody who makes software for either hospitals or clinics on one side or for consumers on the other side those are the ones who really need to understand the api level of detail for the rest we are really looking for them to participate and get the benefits so similarly anybody on the right side we call as a health information user who wants to access a health record and that can be your doctor it can be an insurance company it can just be even your phr app and so any it whole host of use cases now what the government's role is in this is to build or manage and operate these building blocks that you see in the middle so you can see the abha the health id that's being issued you can see the health information and consent manager that's issued and you can also see two other things that we call as registries now the idea here is simple can anybody link a health record to your phr address and what we want is we want only health facilities that are recognized and attributable to be able to link health records to your phr address and so that means any entity or any hospital or clinic that wants to link a health record with a phr address must first sign up for the health facility registry and so registries offer a layer of trust and control to this ecosystem as we kind of build it and this is crux now while i talked about the fact that you are going to get machine readable data when health data is exchanged when we actually started working with integrators the reality we found is that this is the hardest transition for integrators they find it quite easy to actually integrate with the apis and share records in current formats but they find it quite hard and it takes more time to get them to move to a standard format giving you an example for example if you are sharing a lab test report there is a standard that we recommend an international standard that we recommend called loink and essentially we expect every test name to be coded with loink and we found that we have set up in fact a working group to look at this problem more closely we found that india probably just needs about 5000 loink codes for covering most of the tests of india but if you i ask you to go to the loink database and download it you will get 40000 different entries and you don't know which 5000 are relevant or which is the right thing for your tests and so we are starting to now work with many of the integrators 
to try to help them to move. So the policy currently says that you can integrate with ABDM now. You can start sharing your health records with the existing PDF formats today. But in that period of time, and we think that should be an year, we expect you to move your software to providing more structured data. And of course, we will help you through the transition. Without structured data, it's going to be very hard for us to do any kind of major analytics on the data. And that's going to be a key driver. And we expect every participant in ABDM to get this direction going. And that's the crux of this slide in terms of the idea. Now, once we start seeing a flow of structured data, that's when many of the long-term benefits, you know, I spoke so far about only personal health data movement, but ABDM architecture is also designed for aggregated data and anonymized data. You could have seen in the COVID pandemic that since there is no way for the government to really track every COVID test, the only way it could do it was to create a new software and get regulations passed to make sure that every lab, public or private, was actually recording the COVID test. And without that data, we couldn't have really managed the pandemic. Now, we managed to do a point solution for one disease. ABDM is really trying to give an architecture that's across the health ecosystem for a similar set of problems, which actually come for many, many things. You know, it's there for vector bone diseases. You can think of it for a lot of different scenarios in healthcare. Now, apart from health data, the other area that ABDM is working on, and I'll not be brief because just yesterday there was a session on this with uh, the NAT Health guys, is we are working on a layer that actually provides interoperability for health services. For those of you who did not attend, the simplest way to understand this is imagine the fact that a doctor can use any software of their choice. Today, if you want to get a great teleconsultation experience, you need both the patient and the doctor to use the same software or the same platform. The idea with UHI is the doctor can use any software of their choice. They can set their price. They can say when they're available and they can actually deal and do a teleconsultation with a patient who's using any other software of their choice in a completely interoperable fashion. So I have, these are what we call as the layers. It's a slide which has many building blocks, but uh, just to share ABDM is working on three big areas. Uh, we spoke about two of them already. At the bottom, you have the health data exchange layer that's looking at how do you enable a nation to have an interoperable exchange of health data in a way that is compliant to the upcoming laws. And two, we are also working on how to make that happen between payers and providers, especially in the case of health insurance. And similarly, we are looking at how do you enable an interoperable ecosystem for health services or digital health services through the UHI layer. Now, a lot of people on this call and people listening in are likely to be people who are saying, okay, this sounds great. How do I actually get started? How do, what's my first step to get this kind of going? So what we usually say is, if you are a hospital, if you're a doctor, if you're a clinic, then you have to, like I said, do very little. You need to buy an EBDM compliant software, but if you know already having an in-house software or you already have a software, talk to who supplied you the software, ask them you know, to get their software to become ABDM compliant. And they can do that by signing up on something we call as the ABDM sandbox. So sandbox is the place where we have all of these building blocks, the documentation that I spoke about, and where you can actually integrate and test and make sure and certify your application by saying that, hey, my software is now compliant to what ABDM wants. And once your software is compliant, as long as your health facilities upgrade that, your facility can become part of the ABDM ecosystem. Now, the sandbox, you can all go to the site that's called sandbox.abdm.gov.in, and you can see that there's already a large amount of interest. We have had over 1,000, 6,600 applications. This is slightly dated that has come in, and there are now several people who have figured out the whole process and actually reached an exit stage where they have taken their applications into production, including Hardik's company, for example, has done this uh, over the, and we'll talk to Hardik and Hardik will also share some of his experiences of how it was to be part of the ABDM sandbox and the ABDM process flow. So yeah. the way we uh, look at this is, there's gonna be three large groups of organizations that are participating. There is a whole number of players from the government system. So think of, any public health solution from you know, your 
a mother and child program to your TB program, your blindness control program, your COVID vaccination program, they're all participating. Any public health hospital that's treating patients from AIMS, RML to your district hospitals are participating. So the government healthcare is going to be part of ABDM. We have the large corporate hospitals and chains. I already showed you several names that are very active and have agreed to participate. And then there is a whole bunch of people who provide. And of course, 95% of India is, of course, the small players. And really, we believe they can only be serviced by people who are essentially building software for that particular segment. And all of these are participating and going national. So with that, Hardika, that's the end of my presentation. And I hope that set a context. I just yeah. wanted to add one or two things that uh, I heard from um, uh, the uh, uh, queries that came in, in terms of who can participate in this. So firstly, the sandbox itself is open to anybody, including individuals and students. So all of you can sign up, but to go live on production, you need to go through an organization. So the registered entity that can take go live needs to be a legal entity, uh, at least which is an organization. And that organization can be like, you know, a trust, it can be a society, it can be a, uh, you know, private limited or public limited, a LLP, all of that is possible, but individuals cannot take their solutions uh, live at this uh, particular point in time. It's of course open to all health IT players. So anybody can join uh, the sandbox. Uh, I think I spoke already quite a bit about the consent management uh, in which is built in into this bit. Uh, there are two other things that I will just quickly talk about uh, in terms of the process itself. So the National Health Authority is already working with the states and there is already a funding plan to create something called state digital health missions, essentially to make sure that states also continue to take this forward, the vision from ABDM also into the states. And two, uh, while we have a bunch of APIs, ABDM is an evolving uh, program at this point. And as we work with integrators, there is a lot of areas. And I can tell you that in the last six months, I have learned a lot from the innovation that integrators have bought in. We have also helped us identify a lot of bugs, helped us to improve many things uh, with ABDM. And so we do see that the APIs in ABDM are likely to evolve. We do them through versioning in some cases. And in some cases, we add certain additional APIs on the existing versions to support integrators. And we see that that's going to kind of continue. So with that, I think uh, uh, yeah. we can get started on our discussion. I hope that was useful. That was extremely, extremely useful, Kiran. I think that was a very insightful presentation. I think everyone, uh, uh, everyone from the audience will take away uh, a lot of things in terms of the architecture, in terms of the vision, in terms of the current status of APDM. And um, uh, us as a team, um, I think we can we can uh, uh, speak about the whole integration process as well. Um, uh, so the first uh, team within our ecosystem um, that was DocOn, that was the first team which started uh, the integration process with ABDM. And uh, 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 everyone from the team was actually uh, very pleasantly surprised that uh, to to manage this whole process better, there was actually a a professional program management team, which was engaging with them um, uh, through the initial phases of discovering the use cases, understanding uh, the way we are set up, the way we interact with doctors, the way we help doctors onboard themselves onto a digital EHR. So uh, that was actually uh, amazing. That helped a lot. Uh, that uh, you know helped improve on the initial time period where there can be a lot of friction in terms of understanding the use case and truly figuring out what are the next steps right so i think the program management aspect is a is a is a big hit uh, that helped us a lot initially and once we got into the actual integration i think it was it was barely about 4 to 6 weeks uh, there were some initial hiccups but i think because we were one of the earlier ones to start adopting it there were some changes happening but i think we never never had any situation where there were any major issues uh, we got through it very, very uh, quickly and uh, we were able to go live with the use cases as well very quickly. And now, as we know, I think there is a, a good a good amount of developer support on the community as well. The community is also becoming more and more vibrant and thriving. 
so i think these all signs point towards uh, a very good uh, i would say relationship forming between integrators and abdm and uh, to anyone who's uh, listening to us i would uh, sincerely request that you should think about integrating with abdm and um, this this whole process is very well managed by the team it's very professionally managed and i'm sure you'll have all the success in terms of integrating and then taking it to your stakeholders so hardik i'm going to ask you a query right you know i think great i'm happy to hear that uh, you had a reasonably smooth process and i know that uh, you know uh, for any early adopter there is always this uh, initial yeah. uh, learning curve and uh, difficulty that's there but the business question for me is why did you decide to integrate with abdm you know uh, you know thanks for sharing that it was a good process but what were yeah. your drivers for saying i want to participate so um, actually kiran i mean we are we are a bunch of engineers as as founders right and uh, the way we looked at healthcare about almost about uh, 10 years ago when we started thinking about uh, getting into healthcare was that healthcare in india had very broken journeys right if you if you as a if you think of it from a patient perspective um you obviously don't have a longitudinal healthcare record that was in 2012 it seemed like it would never happen but um, uh, even even back then your experience of going from a doctor to a diagnostics lab to a uh, to a pharmacy to a hospital you would actually enter a silo you would have a very broken healthcare experience and that is one thing that we've been trying to solve over the years and we've solved it at certain levels in terms of managing availability better managing accessibility better but to stitch together the healthcare experience in a connected manner you would need identity to be solved first and that is i think the first thing that uh, abdm has solved for and and you need a national um, identity uh, id right uh, you can't do it uh, within a particular ecosystem right uh, any startup can't do it on on their own right so i think this is the most welcome step and that is where we felt that since we are helping doctors create health records digital health records if these digital health records are also now linked with a with a unique id of a particular patient that would start helping us build towards that journey that eventually these patients would have a more unified healthcare journey as they move into different different spheres so that's the that's the business use case that we had in the past as well and actually abdm is helping us achieve it and um, uh, we'll we'll definitely be looking at integrations at hirocare which is the diagnostics entity and uh, at pharmacy where we will uh, take uh, partake as a as a phr sounds wonderful uh, hardik and i think i see one of the queries that has just been coming in on the chat uh, quite relevant you know uh while i think you guys took uh, about 6 weeks or so to do the integration um, what my experience with various integrators in terms of how much effort it actually takes to do it is typically i see them having to deploy the longest phase i see is actually the understanding phase right so correct you know to correct. say that okay what is this entity that i have to do how does this actually fit into my system and that's an effort that only some of the senior architect level people at a organization can really put in uh then there is this second phase which is prioritization when do we do it you know Correct. do we do it now is this important to us is this important from a market perspective so that's the second problem but when they actually have to do it what i typically see is typically two to three engineers and about six weeks of time right Absolutely. that's the real integration effort uh, so to speak and that i hope that helps many people understand the journey that others yeah. have gone through uh in this piece absolutely absolutely um so uh, kiran i also had certain questions um uh, since sure. we are on this forum um so one thing um, anything new right any any new practice any new technology new architecture will have its own adoption curve right and in india if you see tertiary healthcare is dominated on the private sector right? about right. maybe 70% of the market share is on the private side um hospitals doctors opd ipd everything right um are there any um, you know i would say thought process around how to incentivize these uh, entities to onboard onto abdm faster yeah so i think incentives is um, you know so like i said even in all the things that i shared right now and i think even if you look at your own journey from pharmacy's uh, perspective uh, you know you're all coming because of the cause right so there is in the large corporates in our experience so far right 
it's been that this is good for india we are already sharing health records digitally we have reasonable it investments already in place and if this is a low effort and good value to the ecosystem let's participate right and that's what i am seeing today the reality is that we still haven't figured out where is the you know for certain health tech players who are going to come in where will they actually make say certain money for them to do faster investments or even from abdm what are those key use cases that will be revenue drivers for large hospitals and i think we are still at that stage where those use cases are being or will be discovered many of them i think come from the value that will come when you are actually able to use the data to make either better decisions or better judgments but because we haven't still seen that it's like you know we are saying how will we get hot water when we are still laying pipes <laughs> you know i am correct uh, so in some sense and will that you know who will pay for the hot water sometimes so correct <laughs> uh, but i think that will discover and happen so i hope that with these initial early adopters that we are seeing we can actually discover that journey and you know we can actually make that happen but yes it is going to be very important and the government and many people who are working on this are very conscious that economic models for hmm. the variety of actors who participate needs to evolve and the incentives need to be kind of clear now the other bit as i told you is if the data protection bill were to be passed there would be certain amount of demand that would come simply because you need yeah. to be compliant with it right so as a hospital right. you would get probably a two year time frame to become compliant with the data protection act and so having an abdm compliant software would make sure that you are compliant and so that's the other driver that we see at least uh, in the short term outside of any financial incentives that may be in place makes sense makes sense yeah compliance would i think be a, a strong push um in terms of um, uh, so so in in our uh, in our uh, uh, customer base what we see is there is a uh, uh, there's a big segment of uh, patients with chronic diseases and they generally use uh, devices day in day out either to ma- uh, monitor and measure blood pressure or glucose um uh, any any sort of uh, thought process around uh, how to integrate medical devices and that stream of data into abdm yes. uh, what would be the role of uh, that segment of industry yeah no it's a very very good question uh, and i think uh, we talked about how first thing is you know of course we want information from iot devices and home devices to kind of become part of your record right now we talked about how the only people who can link information to your record is a qual- like a certified or a qualified provider who's in your registry and you know iot devices are not going to make it to your registry so in abdm we have essentially said that the other person who can add information to your health record is yourself mm-hmm. so so if you have an id a phr address a registered facility can add records or you can decide to add records so we are, and this is going to happen through the phr app so on the consumer side anything that's going to happen is going to happen through these phr apps so we expect phr apps to be able to okay. integrate with a bunch of devices from fitbits to home monitoring devices to be able to collect the data to organize it and then add it as part of the record and then start sharing it with physicians when patients start visiting physicians and that's how we expect that to happen so uh we think that uh, this is one side and that's for iot kind of devices then you have medical device manufacturers uh, on the mm. other side people like say the ge's who make mris ct scans and so on so we also visualize a world where today if you see many small we know that much of india is run by small doctors right many of them will ask or refer you to go to a diagnostic center where you can get an mri and what they get back is actually a uh, still a print but Correct. we think the full resolution mri should be shareable back and mm. there should be dicom viewers available with these doctors to be able to actually use that and there will be a whole bunch of radiological tools that will also help them uh, you know with new way techniques that will come in right so but the first step of that is to make sure that manufacturer of these large machines are also participating in abdm and making sure that the software in which they are storing all these dicom images also become shareable into this interoperable ecosystem and so those are the two broad right. areas for device manufacturers got it got it uh 
uh, one other one other thing which comes uh, comes into the phrase that eventually we'll have enough data to uh, understand trends or aggregate the data and figure out things at a public health level right yeah. so um, when do you see when do you see clinical uh, uh, clinical decision support systems uh, start like or where do you see that um, uh, the 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 critical period where enough data will be available longitudinally for enough uh, patients that these sort of systems could start evolving yeah see i think clinical decision support systems usually play a role um, in the diagnosis process uh, when you kind of go visit a doctor right and so abdm is really not there except to say hey i can provide access as an input to your cdss saying this was the patient's history and now go right so that kind of becomes a start point in the cdss cycle itself when it comes to public data like stuff about say how many hba1c tests are happening in the country where are they happening how many of them are outside the normal range where are these diabetics as an example of a kind of a data that is going to happen much faster i would say and as uh many of the providers who are starting to join abdm start to create structured data you will start to see that we are able to going to be able to produce those kind of aggregated anonymized data sets that is useful mm. to the ecosystem so my own sense is we are still about a year to two away from that being really available at scale that will make right. value to the country but the process is just starting sure sure um uh, kiran that's about it from my side in terms of questions Great. so we have a bunch of things that have come in on the chat and yeah. i can take yeah. a few of them so i think the uh, the first one something that i kind of talked about so when you if you are an integrator who comes into the sandbox and let's say you finish uh, some of the milestones that we have set you know to make it easier yeah. you have broken up the integration into different milestones so you can when you get out of the sandbox uh after the functional testing and validation we actually give you a little certificate which says that hey you are a recognized certified entity that has kind of integrated with abdm and completed these milestones so that's the question to who's asking is how to become a recognized service to so start on the abdm sandbox and go through the process that's outlined there uh the second question is government looking for a digital platform to integrate industry software for data management the answer is actually no so what abdm is about is a jugalbandi between what we call as public goods with private innovation the government's role itself is going to be restricted to very very few building blocks which the government or in the abdm architecture we view as enables or critical enablers and in all prospects generally the government does not want to be a supplier to anybody on the private or even on the public side it just needs to be an enabler and so that's really how this jugalbandi is being played out so we expect the ecosystem to provide a solution for a variety of problems of course it can leverage the capabilities that abdm brings in in terms of data sharing interoperability and so on uh in terms of data exchange itself there are no constraints the question number 3 here i have is can insure techs and interested insurance companies set up a private data exchange using the consent architecture so at this point the building blocks and especially the consent manager itself is supposed to be a regulated entity it has to have some oversight even in the data protection bill there is something called the data protection authority that provides an oversight so it's unlikely that it will be really open market in in even in the RBI is what's called the account aggregated architecture which is an equivalent architecture in the financial domain the entities have are licensed entities who can operate these kind of instances we think a similar thing might emerge uh, here in abdm but anybody can use data so if as an insurance company or an insure tech company you have a patient who has health information and they provide their consent to access your health information you can very well get access to the health information that's linked to a patient's architecture right so uh i think we already asked answered the question of how long it takes and what's the real effort uh to yeah. integrate with abdm uh so there isn't really a faster helpline or email id unfortunately <laughs> uh, 
we have a dev forum we there is a small team that uh, supports integrators and i know that uh, uh, sometimes i know that people wait for several days to get a response if they post something on the uh, dev forum and this is changing we are onboarding a larger team uh, within the national health authority and uh, that is likely to be in place uh, by mid to end april so uh, we are looking to make sure that as more integrators come along there's going to be better community support uh, we are also bringing certain empaneled partners who can do functional testing who will also then provide additional support uh, to people who are trying to get uh, abdm compliant so i think that's uh, i think you already asked the question on uh, uh, home monitoring yeah. uh, devices yeah, i think uh, we covered that uh, we can do that on healthcare providers getting registered uh, we asked them to start with what we call as our health facility registry that's available at facility.abdm.gov.in and it's a simple form that they can go fill in uh, to actually say that they participate in the ecosystem very recently we came up with a new methodology where the software provider that you use can actually help you do the registration on your behalf and so we hope that will make the onboarding process also kind of faster uh, for people who are kind of coming on uh, i did have a couple of other questions that had come in earlier hardik that i kind of skipped sure. and i uh, quickly uh, yeah look at them and okay. and kiran just one uh, how to grade the awareness of people not preferring okay Yeah, Hardik, you had some question? No, no. I think I think you can go ahead. Yeah, I think yeah. there were some other questions. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I think one of the uh, uh, queries that I had uh, also earlier that uh, uh, kind of came in was, you know, what about preventive healthcare, and uh, you know, who kind of maintains the data? So I would like to kind of uh, just talk about the fact that uh, remember in the ABDM architecture that. the entity that creates the health data is responsible for holding the health data the only other copy for it in some sense is with the patient where you are sharing that health data and of course the patient can share it further which creates more copies uh, with whoever they wish to so that's really how the data kind of flows so it doesn't really matter whether it is curative or preventive uh, we have data formats that are available for both curative and preventive uh, Uh, in fact there is something called a wellness record and you can look at the content of those wellness records as part of our standard where many information can actually be kind of shared and held uh, with these uh, entities i have a question that's coming in which says how do we create awareness for people not preferring an ava id uh, we are facing some issues with government healthcare uh, programs i think uh, this is a more tricky issue because uh, we have always said that abdm is a voluntary program and it's quite important for us that the <coughs> construct stays voluntary healthcare is and can be a very sensitive subject there are many pieces of health information which are very sensitive uh, and we need to make sure that people have the choice and that control on access control on sharing of health data is with the person and i can think of many things from sexual health diseases to you know, say or abortion status to mental health there are a lot of different types of health data where users are going to be highly sensitive and we cannot force people uh, to essentially say hey you must have this you must create a longitudinal record you must have all records and so on so and this is an evolving topic for india folks and we have at this point as per the data protection bill also leaned on the side of the individual and empowering individuals and enabling them to have control as the core principles behind how abdm is progressing and i think with that we have kind of addressed uh, many of the queries i think yeah. that have come in uh, this one anvesha anything else that you would like to do in this session today no that's great i was thoroughly enjoying it and i just hope that the session continues i know we have if there are any more questions we'll be happy to take them but you know otherwise also kiran would you like to say something else to our audience who have joined you know other than i know you have covered a lot of aspects of There's a lot of ground you... and for someone yes. who is new anvesha sometimes uh, you know what we share in about 40 minutes is uh, really quite a bit and i know that there is a lot of digging that they have to do um, firstly you know I, to some extent you know there are if there are many integrators here i would also like to uh, say that we know at nha that some of our documentation 
and other areas can improve and it's a good thing because if we recognize it that you can also bet that we are working on it so uh, my own hope and if you look at other journeys you know and i i take the journey of uh, upi upi the specification actually for the financial sector came out in 2015 the first set of people integrators the early adopters uh, did it in 2016 and i can tell you that in 2016 very few got the experience right the consumer experience right right it took until 2017 before we saw some great experiences it took some demonetization to accelerate the curve <laughs> and really get upi going but today upi is seen as a global globally a very very successful thing that was built on the same constructs and principles that abdm is taking the whole idea of public goods private innovators market ecosystem players coming together to make a big difference for the country and i think just to tell you you know when you think of people who had cards like you know before the digital thing used to be a card right you need to have a debit card or a credit card there were about a million merchants who used to accept credit card or debit cards there are more than 10 million <laughs> merchants who accept upi so in some sense it's not that merchants weren't there there were enough merchants but people willing to now take it to that large level and that's the reason why the transaction volumes and everything is high so upi was in many way democratized uh, democratized you know Correct. this access to financial services there is a similar hope that abdm we are at the start of the journey you know we are about you know august 2020 is the announcement you know the first set of people and the apis is 2021 i am saying you know that in march april you will actually see the first thing touch a large number of people so we are in the early phases of the journey uh, my thing is you know i know that when i deal with integrators i find what i call as the excited early adopters the people who are you know waiting on the wall and the skeptics so, so all of them you know my only thing is what we are working on is for the better of the nation and i think as well as long as we all accept that this is really good for every one of us for the long term and at those on the wall i would like you to kind of jump in and start getting in and those who are skeptic you can keep watching a bit more but you know at some point i hope you'll be converts but that's really you know where i So you know, I see Sorry. one more question has just floated in. But before you answer that question, I want to ask one question because you know I want to utilize this platform. Um, you know, I'm sure there would be many other countries who would have adopted something like ABDM. And you know, is there is a particular model in which we are related to, or we are actually trying to copy? And which country do you think has the robust me- mechanism for the ABDM sort of thing? Yeah. See, I think we are very behind on health data. Yeah. so that's the reality okay uh, much of the western world if any of you have worked in the western world you will know that they are actually very data rich already the key difference there is that the drive to become data rich was really driven by payers so you know if you go to the us market it's the insurers who said hey unless i see this data i am not paying you know so that was the great motivator for uh, that market to the point where there is too much data you know i have an emergency uh, uh, data search i mean an emergency surgeon who works in harvard out of harvard there and he tells me when the patient comes in trying to figure out what i want from that ton of data that may be lying around for the patient is actually the pain so you know they have yeah. kind of overreached on that that's one part the second thing is you will see that your health data moves around between providers without your knowledge or your consent you know it's a private relationship that occurs in many of these markets between providers in terms of mm. the health data movement right we think that both of those models are not the best for india right it's not Correct. see nhs some other countries like uh, socialist countries like the uk or many of europe it's public provider systems that drive it because 90 90% of care is provided by public providers so it's like it's a government big government it system that's bringing the data to india cannot copy either of these two models we do not have Correct. the peer power of pressure we do not have the public provider of domination right so india in some sense is its own unique thing and we need to kind of evolve and i believe that what journey and the choices that we have made so far in abdm are best aligned for our market and our society and our social interests and that's really where i would kind of leave it i wish there was a country that was easy that we could copy and replicate but there is <laughs> okay so for patients is the last question. last question yeah so i think it's an interesting question yes 
uh, at this point we have made it voluntary for everyone it's not just voluntary abdm is not just voluntary for patients it's also voluntary for providers now it's a question that's a good question to ask like i said at some point if the data protection bill comes in it is likely that providers will adopt because you know they have to comply but as it stands today there is absolutely nothing that's pushing them for adoption so what will really push them is if there are valuable use cases of course there is this call that i'm making for you know better of the country which is of course one good call and there will be some portion that will participate but really i'm hoping that the ecosystem will discover which okay. business cases have value as to why providers should participate and i think that will emerge and that will also trigger you know higher participation from the provider ecosystem thank you i mean i think this has been a wonderful wonderful session and kiran i always enjoy listening to you and hardik thank you so much for coming in this platform